Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. Been doing this for over 30 years now, and always the same way. Not just the method, but uh, the same attitude of trying to communicate the Word of God as clearly, as concisely, as straightforwardly as I possibly can. Giving it out just the way God gave it. That's my goal, one verse at a time. For over 30 years, Scripture verse by verse has been just that, teaching the Bible from Genesis through Revelation verse by verse. And you can study all those archives, three complete series going through the Bible, at the website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. So you can click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, and open your Bible and follow along. It's that simple. At the Bible, verse by verse dot com. So check it out when you get a chance. I think you'll be blessed because it's the Word of God. We're in Proverbs chapter 15 today, beginning in verse number 1. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Like someone said, have you ever tried anger or have you ever tried arguing while whispering? Doesn't work very well. Try to argue by whispering. God said it first a soft answer turns away wrath. Sometimes people get all emotional and they start screaming, they start yelling, and it just stirs up controversy. It stirs up discontentment. It it stirs up an argument just by the volume that you use. And so if you sense an argument brewing, you can choose to put a stop to it, at least not get involved in it, instead of trying to out-argue the other person Say something kind to them. Give them a soft answer. A soft answer or a kind word is like throwing a bucket of ice water on the flames of an argument. Now, if you're engaged in a in a texting argument, you're out of luck. I don't like texting. That is a horrible way to communicate. I know sometimes it's better than nothing, but it leaves, it leaves the door wide open to misunderstanding. Texting is not a good way to develop a relationship. Texting is not a good way to communicate. Not if you care about someone. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. In other words, answering someone harshly is like taking a stick and poking them in their sin nature. It's going to make them angry. A harsh answer causes things to get out of control, and the result will be a full-blown argument. Things will be said that shouldn't be said. Hurt feelings will be the result. And what, what could have been stopped with a soft answer will probably explode into a big mess. Verse 2. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. A wise person controls their tongue and they portion out their words to the degree that they are needed. In other words, a wise person, a godly person, knows what, when, where, and how to speak. A flapping tongue is usually nothing but trouble. A flapping tongue is usually trouble. Verse 2. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. There is no wise dispensing of words with a fool. 
Their mouth spews forth verbal nonsense like a fire hose. If they think it, they say it. And their thoughts are not controlled by the Word of God. Their thoughts are hardly even controlled by their mind, let alone the Word of God, which is why they are fools in the first place. That is a fool. Someone who isn't controlled by the Word of God is a fool. They're acting foolishly. That's God's definition. The last people in the world who should be talking a lot normally are the ones who talk a lot. Those who don't have anything useful to say often say the most. Verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Every act, every word, every thought, and every motive of every person. Every thought, every act, every motive of every person who has or ever will live are seen and heard by God. Other people may misunderstand you, but God knows your heart and God knows you. Verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. It hurts to break a bone. It's even more hurtful when someone who's supposed to be close to you says bad things to you. That really hurts because it breaks your spirit. A broken spirit hurts more than a broken bone. It's a deeper hurt. It's tougher to get over. You know, a, a cast and some pills can get you through a broken bone. But only drawing closer to Jesus Christ can get you through a broken spirit. Verse 5. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Talking about an unteachable spirit. An unteachable spirit indicates someone who is ruled by themselves instead of by God. An unteachable spirit is somebody who is under the control of self, their sin nature, not the Holy Spirit, that's for sure. A person who cannot be corrected and refuses to consider the truthfulness of something because it may be unpleasant to hear is no doubt full of sinful pride and will not grow in the Lord and will not grow in wisdom. Everyone needs to have a teachable spirit because we all have a lot to learn. Verse 6. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. You know, wealth is morally neutral. It's neither here nor there. How it is used depends on the moral, moral character of its owner. Money is a way for the godly person to do what is pleasing to God. But money is a way for the evil person to do more evil, which is why God says that in the revenue of the wicked, there is trouble. They misuse their money like they misuse their time, like they misuse their words, like they misuse their strength. 7. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. The fool has nothing to offer in the form of wisdom because they have none. A fool is someone who doesn't listen to God, and if you don't listen to God, you don't have anything to say. No one can instruct unless they first take the time to learn. And we have nothing to offer anyone from God until we put forth the effort to receive from God ourselves. 
And that takes time. That takes time in the Word. Verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The sacrifice of the wicked refers to religious people who don't care about God. You know, there's a lot of religious people who don't care about God. Religious ritual is fine as long as it's not a substitute for a clean life or a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, though, ritual and liturgy take the place of a relationship with God. You got that liturgy down pat, man. You got it memorized. You can say it without even thinking. You can go through the rituals without even thinking. And you have absolutely nothing with God because that's not going to do you any good. Empty ritual, empty liturgy won't do you one bit of good. You think God's impressed with your words and your actions? If your heart's not in it, save it, man. Stay home and watch Face the Nation. Stay home and watch reruns of Bullwinkle. Ritual can be a wonderful way to draw even closer to God if it is the outgrowth of a personal walk with the Lord. But by itself, ritual or religion is nothing. In fact, it's worse than nothing because God says the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. Jesus does not want what you have unless he has you first. That's what he wants. He wants you more than he wants what you have. And that includes your money. That includes your rituals. That includes your liturgy. That includes anything. He wants you more than he more than he wants what you want to give him or decide to give him. He doesn't want us to give because he has needs, because he doesn't have needs. He needs nothing. Jesus wants us to give him, be, give to him because we love him. Give because you want to make him happy. In fact, giving to Jesus without surrendering to him first is a form of mockery. It's like paying your kids off with toys instead of spending time with them. You don't think they get that? You don't think they understand what's going on? You don't think that's going to make them bitter, thinking that you can substitute you for things and you can buy them off? They're not happy with that, or they won't be for long, and neither is God. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. But he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Notice how righteousness is something that we have to follow after. It's something that we have to follow after. That means righteousness is something that must be pursued. You pursue it, you chase it, and you follow after it, or you don't get it. You got to pursue righteousness. You don't have to pursue sin. Sin will pursue you. Sin comes naturally to man. You don't have to work at pursuing sin. Just be yourself and it's going to happen. But holiness needs to be pursued. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes prayer to pursue holiness because it takes work. It takes prayer. It takes effort. It takes time in the Word of God to recognize spiritual blind spots. It takes effort to fight against the natural desire to justify our sinful ways. It takes effort to fight our sinful desires and to say, no, I'm not going to do it because it's unbiblical. I'm not going to do it. Even when every cell in my body is screaming for me to do it, I'm not going to do it. It takes effort. It takes work. But if you want God's best, then you have to put in the effort and you have to make those tough choices. And there's no easy road to sanctification. It comes down to making tough choices. It really does come down to that. 10. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. And he that hateth reproof shall die. If you stop trying to be good, God will punish you. Let me say that again. If you stop trying to be good, God is going to punish you. If that doesn't work, you will die. 
This is some plain talk from God to his people. And we see an example of this very thing in the Corinthian church. They were Christians or they were professing Christians. And in the Corinthian church, there were some who were sick, the Bible says, and there were others who had died because of their sin, which they would not repent of. So don't you think for a second God won't do that to you. He will. God plays hardball. Even with his children, he plays hardball. Maybe especially with his children, he plays hardball. Because the Bible says, those whom the Lord loves, he chastens. We have a strict father. He loves us. He loves us enough to give us a good whooping when we have it coming. And let me tell you something about whooping. They correct you. Whippings, whippings cut through all the excuses and they will correct you. Oh yeah, they will. I'm talking about God and his children, Christians. You can have all the psychological excuses that you want, that somebody wants to give you if you pay them 150 bucks an hour to go sit and listen to them babble. But God's whipping will cut right through that and it will correct you if you're truly one of his children. It's, it's the same with parents and children today. Children, children do not misbehave because they can't keep, they have some kind of a attention deficit disorder. No, no, no. They misbehave because they're not, they're not disciplined. They're not given a whooping as God, as God says they should. Children don't misbehave and scream and yell. Like I just got out of the grocery store a few minutes ago and there was an angry child, probably about three years old, screaming at his mom, angry as could be, and the mom just walking down the aisle with a stupid grin on her face. I almost went up to her and said, listen, lady, if you're not going to discipline that child, then get away from me. And I'm probably speaking for everybody in this store. That child was not disobeying because it was hungry. It was not disobeying because it was tired and needed a nap. It wasn't. It was not doing those things because of that. It was doing those things because that child is not given a proper whooping when it needs it. Look, listen, I see plenty of Amish children and Mennonite children. I see a lot of them. And they are always well-behaved, always very polite. And they get tired, and sometimes they don't have a nap, and I bet you sometimes they want things that they don't get, but they don't act up because they're disciplined. Not out of anger, but love. Christians better quit listening to the government. Christians better quit listening to the psychologists you better start listening to the Word of God or you're going to raise a generation of monsters who are going to end up burning in hell because they have no discipline. And if they don't respect you, they're not going to respect God either. God plays hardball. Even with his children. We have a strict father. He loves us enough to give us a good whooping when we have it coming. And it will correct us. And it'll be painful, but it'll correct us. Verse 11, <clears throat> hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? You know, God sees hell. Hell is before the Lord. God sees hell. Jesus talked about hell more than Everyone else in Scripture combined. Jesus talked about hell. Jesus made hell. Jesus knows that hell is a lake of fire because he has seen it. He saw it when he created it. Jesus knows that he will be sending most people to hell for sinning and for rejecting the mercy that he paid for on the cross. 
Don't tell me that there is no hell. Don't tell me that God doesn't wouldn't create a hell. Jesus created it, and he talked about it. There's a hell, and God sees it. He knows where it is. He knows what it's like. So you better pay attention to what Jesus says about hell. It's a real good idea to pay close attention to what Jesus says concerning, concerning everything beyond the grave. He was there. He came here. He went back there, and he came back here, and then he went back there again. He knows what's going on. Not only that, Jesus is God which means he made everything here and there. He's got firsthand knowledge of everything. You better listen to what he says about heaven. You better listen to what he says about salvation. You better listen to what Jesus says about hell. Jesus knows all about what's out there. So there is no need to speculate, and you better not contradict, or you will have literal hell to pay. 12. A scoffer loveth not one, that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. A fool stays away from wise people because he hates being told that he is wrong. He hates being corrected. A fool stays away from the godly because he doesn't like how he feels when his sinlessness stands next to righteousness. Makes him very uncomfortable. A fool will go to a church if that church doesn't proclaim the word of God the way it should. If you have a church full of few fools, a church full of sinners that don't repent, they feel perfectly comfortable sitting in that church of yours, lukewarm would be a compliment to them. If you have a church like that, you have rocks in your heads for, for brains. If you continue to go to that church and continue to support that no-account preacher, A fool will go to a church that doesn't proclaim the word of God the way it should. But just makes everybody comfortable. A fool goes where he knows he will hear what he wants to hear, not what he needs to hear. Consequently, he never changes. He never becomes less of a fool. He never grows in wisdom. He never grows in godliness. He never improves. He never finds Jesus. He stays very comfortable all the way to hell. 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is broken. A merry heart <clears throat> can only come from knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. A merry heart can only come when a person gives Jesus complete control over their life. A merry heart isn't crushed when something bad happens because a merry heart isn't ruled by circumstances. It's ruled by, by their relationship with Jesus Christ. A merry heart is not crushed when circumstances take a turn for the worse because a merry heart is built upon a relationship with Jesus Christ and faith in the Word of God, and nothing will move those things. No circumstances, no matter how bad they are, will not move those things. The joy of knowing Jesus and fellowshipping with Jesus is the thing that makes a heart merry and keeps it merry. And that is the importance of being in the Word of God because that's what makes us, that's what gets us closer to Jesus. That's what draws us closer to Christ and develops that relationship with Him. But I will tell you that the moment even a Christian loses their Christ focus, their merry heart goes right out the window until they get their Christ focus back. That's why you have to continually get back into the Word of God and continually study the Word of God. Someone says, well, I don't have a merry heart. My pastor, and he's got, he's got three degrees, and he told me I'm going to need years and years of counseling. I heard one guy say that one time. Something happened to somebody, a man, quote unquote, Christian man. It's going to take years. Oh, it was some pastor said something he didn't like. It's going to take years and years and years of counseling for him to get well, for him to be healed. You know, I just about threw up when I heard that. 
If that wasn't the most sickening thing I've ever heard a Christian, so-called Christian, so-called man say, I don't know what was. How putrid is that? Oh, I think you're going to need years of counseling in order to get your happiness back. Well, then God left the church totally unprepared and unequipped for about 1950 years because, it, because all the church had was the Word of God and the Spirit of God and prayer and praise. Boy, did he drop the ball on that one. Took him almost 2,000 years to give us what we need for the joy of the Lord. And by the way, the joy of the Lord is not a result of years of counseling. Boy, how we have fallen in modern evangelicalism. And I say we, I don't mean me. Because I'm not connected to that bunch. Not anymore. But to make stupid statements like that. And don't tell me you don't hear them. I know you hear them. If you go to one of those churches, you hear them. And psychology and counseling have become the new God. Have become the way of sanctification and it is no way. The joy of the Lord is our strength, the Bible says. The Bible says rejoice always. It's a command. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. When you're filled with the Spirit of God, you will have joy. God didn't leave the church unprepared for and unequipped for almost 2,000 years. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. We have everything that we need right there. The onus is on those who teach otherwise to prove it. And they can't. 14. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. A godly person hungers for truth. A foolish person feeds on what feels good to them. Boy, there's the difference. A godly person feeds on truth, hungers for truth. A foolish person, an ungodly person, feeds on what feels good good to them or sounds good to them or tickles their sin nature which is why the godly get godlier and fools get more foolish it's not that complicated is it what would we expect after all we assimilate what we feed on right and it becomes a part of us so if you're going to feed on truth you're going to grow in holiness and if you feed on feel good nonsense you're going to become a feelings oriented Tinseled, covered, nothing. It's hard to stop a train unless you derail it. And repentance and receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is the only thing that can derail the foolish course set by the ungodly and by so many false teachers in the church today. Get in the word. Get in the prayer, into prayer. Fast, pray, praise, worship. Get in the word some more. Study the Word and then study the Word some more. Read the Word and then read the Word some more. It'll sanctify you. It'll give you your joy. It'll give you your peace because it'll give you a close walk with Jesus and I'm out of time. You can continue studying the Word of God. Don't quit now if you have the time. Go to the thebibleversebyverse.com and if you haven't already, begin a verse-by-verse -verse study through the whole Bible. It'll bless you, the whole counsel of God. Click on Genesis Start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Go all the way through the book of Revelation, 66 books of the Bible, and settle in because it's going to take you a long time. It's verse by verse. The whole counsel of God. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if the Word of God blesses you, please remember, we are not underwritten by a large church or denomination. Never have been. This is a faith ministry for over 30 years, just getting out the Word of God like this, trusting that God's remnant will be blessed and fed and will want to contribute and help me to get out the Word of God to more and more people for as long as we can, as much as the Word as I can, to as many people as I can for as long as I can. Join me, would you? It'll bless you. Get in the Word. Click the Donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and give as the Lord leads. Until next time, so long, everyone.